Hello again, everyone, and welcome to Scripture Verse by Verse. My name is Michael Moret. Today we conclude our verse by verse study through the book of um, Philippians, New Testament book of Philippians. So if you can, get your Bible, open it up to Philippians chapter 4. We'll begin in just a minute after I remind you that the Scripture Verse by Verse website can be found at the BibleVerseByVerse.com and that you can study the entire Bible verse by verse using my audio Bible messages at the BibleVerseByVerse.com. Study at your pace, at your convenience. Once again, at the BibleVerseByVerse.com. Check it out. Begin a verse-by-verse study through the entire Word of God if you haven't done that already. You go through three times. This is my fourth series in the last 30-plus years, so there's a lot of Bible there. And uh, take in as much as you possibly can. It's the most important thing in the world. Father, we ask that you would sanctify us by your truth. Your word is truth. In Jesus' name, amen. And we did study chapter 4 of Philippians, verses 1 and 2. So I'll just read those and we'll go right into chapter 3. Therefore, my brethren, dearly beloved and long for, my joy and crown, so stand fast in the Lord, my dearly beloved. I beseech Yodia, And I beseech Syntyche that they be of the same mind in the Lord. And I entreat thee also, true yoke fellow, help those women who labored with me in the gospel, with Clement also, and with other my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. You know, even dedicated Christians like these two ladies, dedicated Christians who work for Jesus, who love the Lord, sometimes need spiritual help. And they needed it here. I don't know what was going on between them, but they were disagreeing about something that they should not disagree about. Very easy to get out of the spirit and into the flesh, even if you love Jesus. But once you do, there's trouble. Everyone needs help in their walk with the Lord. And uh, and it varies from time to time. Sometimes we need instruction. Sometimes we need correction. Sometimes we need rebuke. Sometimes we need training. Sometimes we need encouragement. But most of the time, we need something. Verse 4. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. He said it before and he says it again. Rejoice in the Lord because it is so important. You can always rejoice in the Lord. You can't always rejoice in your circumstances, but you can always rejoice in the Lord because he's always good and he always loves you and he's always in control and he's always working everything, whether you like the thing or not, together for your long-term spiritual good. So rejoice in the Lord. There's plenty of reasons to rejoice in him all the time. And one good reason for rejoicing in the Lord or praising God is because he deserves it. That's the biggest reason, because he deserves it. And praising God is also good because it's good for us. The Bible says that God lives within the praises of his people. So we draw close to God when we give him glory. And that does wonders for our soul. If you're feeling down and out, if you're feeling depressed, if you're feeling discouraged, if you're not as close to God as what you used to be, bite the bullet. And get out the hymn book. And start singing songs. Those are such, those are, you know, those old hymns. Charles Wesley, you know, Fanny Crosby, etc. These, these old timers, you know. They were theologians. And, and their words are so rich. And you just worship God with those things a little while. And, uh, and if you can't sing, read it. Or if you can't sing, sing anyway. God doesn't care. Just do it in a closet so nobody else has to hear you. That's what I'd have to do. I can't sing in public. Hard to lead singing when all you do is move your lips. But anyway, that's a good way to do it. Boy, and I'll tell you, to encourage your soul, get you thinking about God. It really does. And you think about God, you'll be blessed. But praise God. Worship God. Worship. Give Him glory. It does wonders for your soul. And He deserves it. And that's the most important thing. Verse 5. Let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. Moderation. You know, Most of the time, truth exists somewhere between the extremes. 
and behavior too, you know. Don't go out on a wild tangent. Some people get out on these wild tangents when, when it comes to certain beliefs and, uh, and they make more of them than what they should be made of. I mean, it's just, there's so many people who are, who are um, enamored with certain things that uh, may or may not be true, but they've, they've, they just keep pounding it, a certain doctrine. They keep pounding it and pounding it and pounding it, you know. And they lose fellowship with other Christians because they're not moderate enough. And, and I'm not talking about moderation when it comes to the essentials, the things that Bible, the Bible clearly teaches. I mean, we, there's no moderation there. I mean, you just stand fast for the truth of God's word, period. And, and you, don't, uh, you don't try to be moderate in those things. But there are a lot of things, gray areas, in Scripture that... Uh, we can disagree with other Christians over Christians who love God. And that's okay. That's okay. Let them believe what they want to believe. You want to believe that the rapture is pre-tribulation or mid-tribulation? That's up to you. If you want to believe that it's post-tribulation, that's up to you. I'm convinced that it is. And I'm, I'm a former pre-tribulation guy, man. That's what I was taught for over 20 years. But I've come around on that one. But I, I won't break fellowship with you. So let your moderation be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. Notice what he says there. The Lord is at hand. Be gentle. Don't be harsh. We should be honest, and we should speak the truth, even when the truth makes someone uncomfortable. But we should, we should try to do it with kindness. We should try to do it with gentleness. We should try to do it with love. And even if there's a need of correction, even that should be done. The Bible talks about correcting people with gentleness. Now, if somebody is a false teacher, blast them with both barrels because they're leading souls to hell and they're leading souls away from, from Jesus. And I have precedence for saying that. The Apostle Paul blasted Peter to his face in front of everybody because he was leading people astray. He pointed out other people by name too. And he was very straightforward. But when you're correcting somebody who's just simply been led astray or is untaught, then, then correct them with gentleness and kindness. And, and the Bible says here in verse 5, be gentle because Jesus is near. See, that's important to Jesus. He's near enough to see how we are behaving, and it won't be long before we're standing before him giving an account of our life after we came to Christ. And God's nearness and Jesus' nearness should put a holy fear in everyone about behaving the way he wants us to behave. Correcting things that need to be corrected, doing it gently with those who are being led astray or who are simply unlearned, being harsh and straightforward and uncompromising with those who are falsely teaching things, that's true too. You got to stay close to Jesus so that you know how to behave. Verse 6. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. Don't worry. Be anxious for nothing. That's a command from God. Don't worry. Pray instead. When we pray about something, we are placing it into God's hands. Okay? You are delivering it to God like a courier delivers a package. Whatever it is that you pray about, you have just handed it off to God. You've handed it off. You've put it in his loving, all-powerful, all-wise hands. And that's why we can pray. And after we pray, we can trust that God will take care of it the way he knows is best. Why would you pray if you didn't believe that? Now, if we're going to worry about things not turning out the way we would like them to turn out, then we've got a bigger problem, and that's sinful self-centeredness. Why are you concerned about things? Why are you worried about things not turning out the way you want them to turn out? 
you are not the issue, and neither am I. you got a bigger problem. Your problem is not your worrying. Your problem is your sinful self-centeredness. And in that case, if you got that, you deserve to worry. No wonder you're worried. In that case, your worrying is a consequence of your sin, a sinful self-centeredness. You want your will to be done. Pray and trust God to do what he knows is best and leave it in his hands, even if it's not your first choice. And you're not going to worry. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. Don't forget the thank yous when you pray. You know, no one likes being taken for granted, and that includes God. Besides, being unthankful is often the first step toward falling away from God. You forget where the good came from, or you forget that God is a giver of good things. When we forget that we depend on God, we soon forget God altogether. 7. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Prayer and thanksgiving to God leads to inner peace. It is the peace of God that surpasses all understanding. When we pray and we thank God for all things and trust him for all things that he knows better than we do and he still loves us even if we don't understand why he's not doing things our way, God will give us peace that doesn't even make sense given our circumstances. People look at you and say, you're crazy. How can you have peace? Your situation is miserable. Well, you know what? Our circumstances might be lousy. Everybody has problems, but God will flood our soul with peace if we pray and trust him. Not trust him again to give us what we want, but trust him to do what is right. If you have an agenda, you can throw peace right out the window. I mean, it's not wrong. The Bible says you have not because you ask not. So that's fine. I mean, in that sense, it's okay to have an agenda. To, to, to want something, sure, fine, pray about it. But after you pray about it, leave it in God's hands as to whether he's going to give it to you or not. Because I got news for you, it is in his hands. So you must just trust him with it. And you will have peace. Verse 8, finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatever things are honest, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things. If you're going to dwell on something, then by all means dwell on good things. Think about what God says is right. Think about all the good things that God has done and God will do. Don't pretend. Don't pretend the bad doesn't exist. God doesn't ask you to do that. That's just living in a land of make-believe. Don't pretend that the bad doesn't exist. But some people are constantly dwelling on and talking about negative things. And that's not good either. That's a recipe for depression. And, and it's draining to be around people like that. Verse 9. Those things which ye have both learned and received, and heard, and seen in me, do. And the God of peace shall be with you. In other words, obedience to God is a prerequisite to having the peace of God. Say it again. Obedience to God is a prerequisite to having the peace of God. Worry is a sin. And worry is also the result of sin. If you sin you're not going to have peace with God. If you commit any sin, you're not going to have peace with God. If you are living a compromising lifestyle, when it comes to the Word of God, you're not going to have peace. You're not going to have the peace of God because you're not going to have peace with God. And like I said, worry is a sin. God says don't worry. So if you're worrying, obviously you don't have the peace of God. And why don't you have the peace of God? Because you're worrying? No, because you're sinning by worrying. And there is an alternative, you know, praying and trusting God. Verse 10. But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at the last your care of me hath flourished again, of which ye were also mindful, but ye lacked opportunity. 
you know, people can't tell if we care about them unless we do something to help them in some way. If we don't show our concern, then no one will know that we are concerned. Well wishes are nice, but they mean nothing without acts of kindness to go along with them. And uh, the Philippians, I mean, I actually cared about Paul. They just didn't have opportunity to show it. Now they do, and so they do. And now all doubts are removed if there were any. Verse 11, not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am in this to be content. Contentment is something that must be learned. Paul said, I have learned to be content. It has to be learned. It's a byproduct of spiritual maturity. It's a byproduct product of spending time with Jesus and learning how much he loves you. Because the Bible says perfect love casts out fear. If you know that someone loves you with a perfect love, you're not going to be afraid that they're going to hurt you in some way. You're going to trust them. You're going to have peace. If you know how much Jesus loves you, and there's only one way to learn that, and that's by spending time with them, you're not going to be afraid. You're going to have peace. Twelve. I know both how to be abased and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to be both to abound and to suffer need. Life is a mixed bag of good days and bad days. So unless unless one wants to be an emotional roller coaster, you better put Jesus Christ first and find your contentment in your relationship with him because that'll stabilize you through both good times and bad. Verse 13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. All things that God wants you to do. There's a lot of, a lot of God's people who were called by God to do something and their first response was, I can't do it. And God had to convince them, wait a minute, if I'm calling you to do something, I'm gonna give you the ability to do it. Moses, I can't do it, God. I can't go down to Egypt. I can't speak well enough, I stutter. I'm slow of speech. God says, who made your tongue? I'm going to put the words in your mouth. Jeremiah said the same thing. God, I've, I've, God said, Jeremiah, I've called you to preach my word. Jeremiah says, I'm just a kid. I can't speak very well. God says, you're going to speak everything that I tell you to say. And don't you be afraid of people's faces when they don't like it. You just keep preaching. Isaiah 2. God says, I'm calling you to preach. I'm calling you to deliver my word which wasn't an easy job for either him or Jeremiah, or Moses for that matter. It's not, really, you know, it's not fun to preach the word of God to people who hate it. So, so Isaiah said, oh, man, I, I'm a man of unclean lips. I can't do it. God says, I'll do it. I'll do it through you. And he did. So, you know, we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. That means anything that God has called you to do, he will enable you to do. And by the way, we belong to Jesus if we're Christians, right? You're his possession. You have made him your Lord and Savior if you are saved. He is your Lord. That means he belong, you belong to him. And in that case, you can only do what he allows. So it doesn't pay to worry about what we can't do. Just don't even go there. God will give us the grace and the means to do what he wants us to do, and we have to be content with that. Or we'll go out of our minds if we're not. Verse 14. Notwithstanding, ye have well done that ye did share with my affliction. It's good when we try to help someone and help to get them through hard times. A little bit of help can make a big difference in someone's life. And if nothing else, if, even if you can't do a whole lot, it's nice to know that you're not alone when you're suffering. Verse 15. Now ye Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church shared with me as concerning giving and receiving, but ye only. That, here you got, that's tough. Because God says that the laborer is worthy of his pay. You got preacher who's out there preaching the pure word of God and you're not helping them out, man, that's, that's not good. It's, it's hard enough work to preach the word of God when you're preaching it straight because nobody else deserves to be supported. 
by Christians. Many of them are overly supported because they tickle the ears of people. They get support. They're the ones who are making the big money. But the preacher who's out there preaching the pure word of God, I mean not compromising, just proclaiming the whole counsel of God and doing it in a straightforward way, they're going to get opposition from the world, the flesh, and the devil, and a lot of times from professing Christians too. So they need the help of Christians who love God's word and agree with what they're saying. And so here you have the great Apostle Paul, and I say that and I mean it too. He's out there proclaiming the word of God, getting sort all sorts of opposition, as you will if you proclaim the word of God. And nobody helped them. Nobody helped him out except the Philippians. It's hard when Christians don't give. It was hard on the apostle. It's hard on a preacher. And you know what else it is? It hinders the work of God. I'm not saying you I'm not saying that Christians aren't allowed to spend their money on recreation. But it is sinful. It is selfish. It is ungodly. And it is lukewarm at best to spend tons of money on recreation, on food, on clothing, on houses, on cars, on this and that, and vacations. And there's nothing wrong with any of these things, but it is a sinful self-focus to spend tons of money on that and then tip God. And that's what a lot of people do. They tip God. Where your treasure is, that's where your heart is also. The Philippian Christians were one of the few groups that supported the Apostle Paul. And you can see right here, he didn't forget about their faithfulness, and believe me, neither did God. Verse 16. For even in Thessalonica, you sent once and again unto my necessity. And that's really amazing. They See, they gave because they knew it was the right thing to do. They gave because they knew it was what pleased Jesus. They even gave offerings to Paul when he was in another place ministering the word of God to others, not them, because he, they knew that he was doing the right thing. They knew that, that he was doing the work of God by proclaiming the word of God clearly. So they gave, whether they were getting any immediate benefits out of it or not. That's what you call a heart for God. They gave because the work was honorable and it was right. 17. Not, not because I desire a gift, but I desire fruit that may abound to your account. See, stop there for a second. When we give to the work of God, God credits our spiritual bank account. You know, so much giving today goes to church expenses, big buildings, elaborate things that go on in churches, all sorts of programs, all sorts of committees, all sorts of stuff. And such a small percentage it so often goes to really proclaiming the word of God. But when you give to get out the word of God, not for all the coverings, not for all the tinsels, not for all the flash, but when you give truly to the work of God, which is go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, that is what Jesus told us to do. That is the work of God. When you give to that work, God credits your spiritual bank account. With what? I'm not sure. But you can be sure that if it's a reward from God, it's better than anything that you can possibly imagine. Verse 18. But I have all and abound. I am full, having received of Epaphrodites the things which were sent from you, an odor of a sweet smell, a sacrifice acceptable, well-pleasing to God. Anything a Christian gives to the work of God, and again, what is the work of God? Well, I don't know. What did Jesus say? One more time. Matthew chapter 28. Go into all the world and preach the gospel, baptizing them, 
making disciples of all men. Luke says, Jesus said in the last chapter of Luke, go into, the, go into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature. That's the work of God. That is our assignment. That, those are our marching orders to get out the word of God. Not to build bigger buildings, not to spend tons of money on fancy carpet and fancy this and fancy that and this thing and that thing. All of it is fluff. All of it is tinsel. What good is it? That's not what Jesus told us to support. So many people are caught up in a churchianity. Their life revolves around their church. This thing or that thing that's going on in the church. How much of it really is about getting out the pure word of God? Really, take a good hard look at it. But anything that a Christian gives to the work of God is seen by God as an offering to him. You are given, you are putting it in his wallet. When you give to a ministry that is teaching the word of God, you are giving to God and you are pleasing God. And isn't that nice? I just, I just get such a thrill out of that. We all know how to displease God, and we all do it enough. So it's nice to know how we can please God as well. And giving to his work pleases him. 19. But my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. God will give us what we need. He will. Maybe not what we think we need, but he will give us what we need. For as long as he wants us here. 20. Now unto God and our Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. Everything should be done to glorify God. Everything. If I'm not teaching to glorify God, my motives aren't right. Now, there are a lot of good motives for teaching the Word of God. I want you to learn. I want you to be saved. I want you to be drawn closer to Jesus. Yeah, that's, those are a lot of good reasons to, to preach the Word of God. But the supreme reason for proclaiming, teaching, and preaching the Word of God is to glorify God because it's what He wants to do and because it makes Him look good. Everything should be done to the glory of God. If it doesn't honor God, then the Christian shouldn't be doing it. 21. Greet every saint in Christ Jesus. The brethren who are with me greet you. Christians ought to be gracious and polite to one another. Make one another feel welcome. Again, if you're a Christian and you're out there proclaiming the word of God, you're out there living for Jesus, man, you need, you need to be greeted and you need the fellowship of other Christians who truly love Jesus as well. Because you're not going to get that kind of love and acceptance in the world. 22. All the saints greet you. Chiefly, they are of Caesar's household. I love this. Caesar's household was filled with saved people. You say, how did that happen? Well, guess who was a Roman prisoner? The Apostle Paul. Guess what he was doing when he was there? Complaining that he was a prisoner? No. Taking advantage of the opportunity to do what he otherwise would not be able to do. He looked for Jesus in his problems. He looked for the reason that Jesus wanted him to be there or allowed him to be there. And he lived for Jesus and he did the work of, of Christ. And he did the work of Christ, which is what? Getting out the word of God, witnessing for Jesus, praying for lost souls. That's, it's very simple. The work of God is not complicated. It is covered with a lot of tinsel today in most churches. But the word of, work of God is to proclaim the word of God to make disciples or help make disciples. And he did that. He was in prison and he did. That's why there's so many saved people in Caesar's household. Look for Jesus in your problems. Look for Jesus in the circumstances that you find yourself in that you wish were different. So a lot of people who worked for the Roman government were coming to Christ because they were given the word of God, especially by Paul, who was a Roman prisoner. See, God is working all things together for good, even those things that you don't necessarily like. And then he finishes, 23. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. God's grace. His unearned favor toward us. Without that, through Jesus Christ, we'd all be dead and in hell. Thank the Lord.
through Jesus Christ that you won't burn in hell if you have received him as Lord and Savior. And help get out the Word of God. You do real good. If you do that, you'll be pleasing to Jesus. Well, we'll stop here. Thank you for joining me. Thank you for spending this time with me and for studying the book of Philippians with me. I hope it's been a blessing to you. It's been a blessing for me to teach it to you. Always is, of course. And you can continue studying whatever book of the Bible you want to at your pace, at your convenience, at the Scripture Verse by Verse website, which is found at thebibleversebyverse.com. So check it out and begin a verse-by-verse study through the Bible. One more time at thebibleversebyverse.com. And if the Word of God is a blessing to you, remember, please, that we're brought to you by your prayers and financial support. Couldn't do this without your help, of course, without the help of God. But he uses people like you. This has been a faith ministry for over 30 years, which means I always have depended on individuals to pray for this ministry and to support this ministry. And you can do that. You can do that at the BibleVerseByVerse.com. Just click the donate button and prayerfully give as the Lord leads. And please pray for this ministry. Please pray for me that God's word would God's word would go forth with power and be accepted, even as it has been accepted by you. All for Jesus' glory. Until next time, Michael Moret for Scripture Verse by Verse. So long, everyone.